Hey guys, no it is not Gun Tuesday. Don't worry, this isn't gonna be another gun video. I brought these out to make a point based on a very, very cool question slash rant one of my YouTubers sent in on today's Q&A Tuesday. So, Ryan writes the following. Hey, this is an email for Q&A, right? Right, this is. Hopefully it is because here goes my rambling. So Ryan went on in a bit of a rant. And this is what he wrote. And I'm gonna try to pronunciate this so it comes off because as I read it, I really, really smiled and, and I really feel your pain. It seems nowadays there's no such thing as a casual watch buyer. You can never just own one Samaritan, damn it. You need a whole fucking collection. I'm, you've got to have the date, the no date, toss in a couple of vintage models, definitely can't forget that birth year sub, and you've got to have one with some gold in it. But wait, they just released the new 41 millimeter models, gotta stock up on them, because the dozen you already own isn't just quite enough. While you wait for your ID to call you for pickup of the new 41 millimeter date and no date version, you search the forums for the best dress watch, even though the last black tie event you went to was five years ago. Why? Because every collection needs a dress watch. You figure you'll wear it as much as you wear the Speedmaster, which of course you bought because every collection needs a Speedy. Deep down you know you'll never wear the Speedy because that would betray your Daytona you spent $25,000 on. I admit, I'm being a bit overdramatic here. I, you know, I love this. <laughs> but where did the obsession with collecting come from? What was the catalyst? I'm sure in the not so distant past, the majority of people were satisfied with a one or two watch collection but that's not the case anymore. And it isn't just with Rolex or other luxury brands. People are also collection hungry with cheap AliExpress brands. Is this collecting obsession that is stopping people from being able to buy Rolexes at their local AD? Your low viewer, I love your handle, Poopy Fingers is his handle on YouTube. I wonder where that came from. Uh, anyway, this brings me to why I have guns on my table, right? And I'm sure you may have noticed these are not exactly modern guns, these are very, very old guns. I collect guns, I collect antique guns. I collect guns that go back all the way to the 1800s. I even have some guns that date back to colonial time as well as the American Revolution to include things Civil War and so on and so forth. So I understand exactly what you're saying because one is never enough. When you're talking about collecting, collecting automatically means collections, right? It doesn't automatically mean I'm gonna buy one gun, enjoy it for a few days, and then I'm gonna go and trade this one in and buy another one. Case in point, I'm gonna give you one example. Again, I'm a big collector of Smith & Wesson revolvers. Why do I like Smith & Wesson revolvers? Because they have a lot of firsts under their belt. They came up with the first modern revolver as we know them today, where the holes in the cylinders go all the way through, therefore giving birth to the first modern bullet, which you see here today, it's known as the 22 short. It's a first in case bullet, you know, past the powder and ball and all that other stuff. I'm sure you guys have seen some movies. What I have here is the very, very first revolver they made. This is a tiny little thing. This is a Smith & Wesson Model 1. Of course, these can be picked up, up anywhere from $1,000 all the way up to six, $7,000, depending on condition, how complete they are. I even have the original box, right? This is the original Gotta Percha box, as they call it, back from 1847, right? And again, there go the original bullets. You can see they're, uh, Let's, let's just say they've aged with time, right? They don't look like a modern bullet, just a side point, because uh, modern bullets are center fire. This was rim fire. So the hammer would hit this bullet on the side or on the rim of this bullet that you see sticking out to make it fire. Now, why am I showing you all this? Well, because they came out with this gun in 1847, but then they did it in six variations because during those times, there was a lot of innovation going on in the gun world and it kept improving upon, and improving and improving. This was a first, right? There was obviously a lot of room for improvement. This, was, this is what's called a top break, right? A, you know, normal revolvers nowadays, you press a little lever on the side and the cylinder comes out, right? Here, you actually have to take out the cylinder and you can see the cylinder is bored all the way through. And when I tell you they're so minimal across different types, and as you get into different models and so on and so forth, but as a collector, I want to have every single one of them, right? Why? Because I am that diehard Smith & Wesson collector, and for me, there's nothing better to say, hey, I have every single type of the Model 1. Isn't that cool? It may seem dorky to a lot of you guys out there that are not into this kind of stuff. Like, why? Just get the one and it's representative, right? 
but now it is. And why do I have this beautifully engraved gun here? This is a 45 caliber, beautifully engraved pre-model 25 from 1952 that has never been fired, right? This is an NOS gun, believe it or not. And this thing is factory engraved and it is an absolutely gorgeous piece of art outside it being a kick-ass gun, right? So, and it's, it's a big ass gun. I mean, they've come, let's just say they've come a long way from the 1847 to, you know, 1952. In fact, this gun is made till today. This is a pre-model 25. They have a model 25-14 right now, I think, or something like that, right? And they still make this gun. But point of the matter being is that I have more than one of these, but when I came across one that's factory engraved, there's only two of these made in the world. I quickly went and picked it up, even though I technically don't need it, right? And here's the worst part about it. I don't even shoot these things, as you can imagine. Well, for one, this is a black powder gun. I don't trust to put a bullet that's 170 years old into this to shoot it. And if I put a modern bullet in there, it'll blow up, right? One last example is the famous 357 Magnum, right? This is probably the most collectible gun from Smith & Wesson, right? And guess what? It's exactly the same gun, but they call them registered magnets because this was a special order gun and outside of it carrying the normal serial numbers everywhere, it also carries a registration number. So that's why these guns are super collectible. But guess what? Here's a 357 registered magnum with a five and a half, with, with a six and a quarter inch barrel, right? Well, they made these in 20 different barrel ends. So guess what? Same exact gun, but here's another one with an eight and three quarters. I mean, dirty Harry, move over, right? And yes, as a collector, I want to have all the different lengths, right? And then condition comes into play, which is very comparable to vintage watches and things of that nature, right? So look, collectors are going to be collectors. What you're ranting about is always going to stand true for anything. And I don't care if it's vintage guns, I don't care if it's watches, I don't care if it's stamps, coins, et cetera, et cetera. There's always some kind of a caveat that makes a collector feel warm and fuzzy inside saying, oh, I just completed an error or I just completed a set. Oh, I have every single Submariner model and its variations going back to the 1970s, which is hundreds of different watches, right? Because hey, Rolex makes such slight changes. Like they made it one millimeter change and everybody's going to eat right? The new Rolex right now is trading at like 15 or 16,000 or something. I just bought a brand new Submariner. I paid $14,500. So they're trading at 15.5 to 16.5 right now. They're gonna come down a little bit, but they're still gonna trade over this due to the hype, right? Uh, the Speedy. I'll give you a comparable gun to the Speedy. Hey, hold that thought. Here's a Smith & Wesson Model 60. Looks like a pretty familiar gun, right? You've probably seen police officers in pretty much any movie out there carrying these. Any movie from the 70s, 80s, 90s, you see police officers carrying these things. This was a 38 Special issued to the police department. Why do I have this? Seems like a no big deal gun. This would be the Speedy comparison to some of these guys. Well, there's a reason for that because the Model 60 which came out in 1960. They weren't very creative with their model numbers. The Model 60 was the first stainless steel gun ever made, and not just by Smith & Wesson, but any gun, right? They were the first guys to use stainless steel. Of course, the story goes, this is the very, very first model from the 60s. It's very, very shiny. The story goes that the police said, hey, you need to subdue these guns because every time we pull it out of our pockets, it looks like a flashlight, right? So they started making them a little more subdued. But again, this would be comparable to a Speedy, as you mentioned. But yet, as a collector, I still want to have it. And even though, Again, a little difficult to compare. It's not like I wear these, right? But even though this isn't a gun that's gonna be that wild gun in my collection, it's still, as a Smith & Wesson collector, that's a must have. That's the speedy right there. And most people that look at my gun collections that are into guns as well, when they look like, eh, not that Model 1. Oh my God, that engraved piece. Oh, that 357 Magnum register. Oh my God, that's unbelievable. And they get to that and I'm like, eh, it's a speedy, right? And if I told you right now, he has an unlimited budget and gave you the opportunity to go back to the very day that the Submariner was created, which was, Ian, put that on the screen. I don't remember exactly what the first, the year the first Submariner was made. So if I gave you the opportunity to go back and buy every single sub ever made up until today, if you had that unlimited budget, I guarantee you would go out there and do it. And that's the craze behind every collector out there, whether you're a watch collector, a stamp collector, or a vintage gun collector such as myself. Of course, um, I should actually, uh, answer a question that's in here. Is this collecting obsession that is stopping people from being able to buy Rolexes at their local AD? This crazy collection passion obviously adds fuel to the fire because it increases the demand. It increases the demand tremendously, especially across Rolexes, right? So it is part of them not being able to buy the stuff at ADs. It's supply and demand, right? There's very short supply of Rolexes and there's a very, very high demand, always has been. So yes, theoretically, the answer to your question is yes, because ADs can't get enough. So hope this sheds a little bit of light into your question. Guys, I hope uh, 
I hope it's okay for me to share my little crazy hobby with you. Uh, I mean, I could do an entire episode on my gun collection. And uh, I'm actually putting together a collection and I want to create like a mini museum in my basement. My wife is on board, which is great, of the history of the American guns, starting from colonial times all the way out to World War II, right? Covering all the major events. Obviously, colonial times, Spanish-American War, the Revolution, Birth of America, all American Indian Wars. And again, I'm not trying to give you a history lesson here. I love American history, so... I'm gonna base it on major events in American history, and that's gonna be my little mini museum. This is a project that's gonna take me at least five years to do because A, it gets expensive, and B, it's not very easy to find guns from colonial times, as you can imagine. Moving on to the next question, and I'm gonna get these guys out of the way real quick. Next question comes from Jason. Hey Roman, I just ordered the books for the Rolex Submariner from Mondani. My son really enjoys your show, and when I mentioned you, the family, kindly offered to sign the books for Alex. I told you guys in the past, I'm really good friends with the Mandani family. Uh, me and Georgia are really, really good friends, even though she's in Genoa in Italy and I'm in Philadelphia. It's a bit far away, but we do get to see each other quite often in a lot of the trade show, although not lately. Corona, right? Uh, your video is a really cool and honest representation of what the watch industry is like. I have a question. I've noticed because the vintage Rolex sports are so tricky, newer models are becoming more attractive because there's less chance that parts have been replaced. What's your take on this? For example, Hulks in the UK are trading at 15,000 pounds, but a vintage 5513 in, say, mid-70s full set is about the same price. I appreciate your advice. P.S. Give a shout out to my accountancy firm, Michael George, as we have a lot of watch dealers as clients. So... Shout out to Michael George Associates. And Ian, if you can put their website up online, if you guys in the UK, look them up, I guess. Uh, so look, you're right. And I discussed about parts being replaced and things of that nature. So this is where you have to create a rule of thumb. Number one, first and foremost, rep reputation, right? Reputable, reputable, reputable guys. If you notice, and I've told you guys this before, I have some vintage pieces online, but not a whole lot. And the reason for that is because some of them I sell off privately and I don't bother advertising them and I, I also don't feel I have enough knowledge quite yet to be able to deliver a super correct piece but this isn't something you trade on a daily basis it's very easy to miss something out so oftentimes I'll partner up with guys like Adam from Mental Watches among many other guys you've seen me do videos with Bob Barron I'll get out there and get an expert opinion you know surprise surprise I'm not an expert in everything I make mistakes in these videos often just as well even if I'm talking about modern watches nobody's perfect right but again Parts trading, this is the rule number two, parts being exchanged. You have to understand something. What's born with a watch is your movement and a case. And the movement belongs to a case. And there are serial numbers, there are stampings, there's everything else. Everything else that's on a sports Rolex model doesn't necessarily have to be born with a watch, but it necessarily has to be the correct part. There's two parts. There's your regular parts and there's your service parts. The minute you put on genuine Rolex parts, which are service dials, service inserts, service something or other that happened during service, and this has happened often when you, people used to send their Rolexes in for service, that's when it devalues the watch because now it's not the original bezel insert. It's not the original uh, dial. It's not, they're not the original hands or even maybe crowns or pushers. But here's the big but. Let's say tomorrow I receive two identical 5513s. One has a service bezel, uh, the other one has a service dial. If I basically take the watch with the original dial and put the original bezel onto that, or vice versa, I have done nothing wrong because that's a dial that belongs to that particular watch. This is where it doesn't hurt the watch, and this is where you shouldn't have to worry about that. What you should be worried about is things like repainted dials. Be aware of aftermarket crowns. You could be aware of even aftermarket bezel inserts, right? And, and so on and so forth. And this is where the trust factor comes in, because that little insert that goes on top of, of the watch, where in some vintage Rolexes that can mean a difference of five to $25,000, right? That's not something you can check by serial number and say it's that. This is where the trust factor comes in, and also not if you're going to get into vintage watches, do your due diligence. Don't dive in and just stop buying stuff, right? Or in the very least, find somebody who's 100% trustworthy and comes highly recommended. Because if you're out there buying modern watches and you have a dealer that you trust or a few dealers that you trust, they can li very likely recommend you a vintage dealer. Or better yet, get out there and source that watch for you from somebody that they trust not to ruin the relationship that they have with you. Because the last thing I ever want to do, especially for my modern guys, I had, I had guys that were buying Richard Mills and APs all of a sudden. It's like, hey, you know what? I want a really, really nice Paul Newman Daytona. And believe me, before offering them anything, I went through seven or eight different pieces. I made sure that this is 100% correct. And that's when I offered that watch, right? Now, if somebody's going to offer you a watch that has a service dial or a service bezel, 
that's also okay because A, you're going to save on price. And as long as they tell you about it up front, you're also okay with that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, let me go back to my guns, right? It's all about condition, right? So you can have a gun that trades at $1,000 in certain condition. The minute it goes over 80 plus, it trades at six, seven, eight thousand dollars Condition, condition, condition. All the original parts, all the original markings. Same kind of ordeal. Have I bought guns in lesser condition? Yes, because there's some guns out there that in high condition can demand $80,000. One in shitty condition can be bought for five, but it can still be a representation of a particular gun in a particular set that I'm trying to put together. And I consciously bought that gun knowing that I'm saving myself a shit ton of money. I guess, I guess, I guess I have to do it again. For all you guys that have watched American Westerns, you should know what this is, right? This is a Colt. This is a Colt Army Model 1860, right? The condition on this gun is a very, very poor. It's reminiscent of the original uh, Colt Walker. Of course, the Colt Walkers fetch 70, 80, sometimes even $100,000 if you can find one. Well, this was a later model, but I'll show you where the condition is really, really terrible. The best part about this gun and why I bought it is because all the numbers are matching, but it also came with its original stock. It's extremely rare to find this gun. And what happened was, is these guys, uh, the cavalry, would have the stock that they can put onto the gun and it automatically became a carbine. So now this is sort of a carbine, or a small rifle, right? What, why I bought this is because the numbers on the stock are matching to the gun, right? The serial numbers are the same. Now, this is a needle in a haystack to find. And when I spoke to Rock Island Auction House, where they're, some, they're probably the biggest auction house in vintage firearms, uh, they told me, had this gun been in 85 plus percent condition, this would have been a quarter million dollar gun. In the condition that it's in, it's a $15,000 gun. You see the humongous difference? So again, this is me making a conscious choice saying, look, I'm not spending a quarter million dollars. A, I probably won't find this. And B, I'm gonna save myself some money to fill a void in my collection with this particular example. And I'm lucky enough to find it with a stock. So uh, just to sum this up, and I keep coming back to guns, but this is not what the show is about, right? I am a fan of buying vintage. A lot of people, and this is, I talked about this with Bob the very, very first where we did, where he said, you know, people are buying up modern collectibles or manufactured collectibles. That's what the Hulk is. That's what a lot of these new Samaritans are. They're manufactured collectibles. There's a lot more of them being made and going to be made, right? Well, the Hulk is discontinued now, but irrelevant, right? There's not many 5513s left from the 1970s. There weren't as many manufacturers, number one, and there's not as many ones left. Some got destroyed, thrown out, lost. I mean, all those things happen, right? A lot of them were service, replacement parts, this, that, and the other. And again, it wasn't as an expensive a proposition back then, so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not strange for this watch to just literally stop working after a while, get beat to shit, and somebody just got rid of it, you know? I can see that happening as well. Uh, complete box and papers, right? All those things, it diminishes the amount of goods that are out there. So I am a fan of going backwards and spending money on something that's already a collectible. A 5513 from the 70s is 50 years old, right? By the time your son grows up and has a son of his own, probably be another 20 years, right? That's why it'll become 70 years old. That's why I always say going backwards is great. But keep in mind that that still has to be appealing to you, right? It ha you still have to be passionate about it. You still have to love that watch as much as the Hulk. And if it's the Hulk that you love more, forget about vintage. But it's all about who you buy from. It's about becoming knowledgeable in what you're buying yourself, not just relying on the trust you have of a particular dealer, and setting a threshold. Say, hey, where's my threshold when it comes to these things? I will only take an all-original wall with all, with all original parts, with com complete with box papers, hang tags, and I want the original purchase receipt, right? I have watches like that. Or, you know what, I'm okay to have a representation of 5513, so I'll get out there, buy one without box and papers, where the dial won't be as perfect, where condition is not gonna be the same, the case may be a little bit over polished and things of that nature, but I'm gonna save myself a ton of money, but I'm still gonna have the 5513 because at the end of the day, I wanna wear it, enjoy it, and this is what I like. So I hope this sheds a little bit of light into your question. I'm gonna take one more because this thing is up running long. By the way, I didn't, I, I definitely planned to show you guns the first question. Somehow I managed to bring a gun in on the second question because remember, I answer these off the cuff as they say, but it just so happened that I can bring in a gun. What is the most exciting thing that can happen on TV or in movies or in real life? Somebody has a gun. That's why I always start with a gun because you can't top it. You just can't. If see if the next question will require me bringing out another gun. Uh, this one is from Jared. Hey Roman, I really appreciate the watch content you've put out over the past couple years. Before I subscribed to your channel, I never had a serious interest in watches, but recently made my first purchase of vintage Omega Speedmaster. Congratulations, and I'm sorry. 
Welcome to the club. It's a very slippery slope. Uh, my question is about your business. How were you able to scale to $100 million revenue? On the surface, it seems like it would be really difficult to scale a business that relies on you, your partners, to constantly find watches and jewelry at good prices on a secondary market. After all, there's only so much time in your day. You can only be in one place at one time. Did you have to teach people how to source inventory for you? I'd love to hear more about how you got to that point. Very simple answer. Number one, diversify within the business. Originally, it was retail, then we went to wholesale. Wholesale allows you to scale your numbers a lot higher because you're selling kind of in bulk and you're selling more. Second thing is that $100 million a year sounds very fancy, but you know we also sell two, three, four, sometimes million dollar watches, which you can add to the revenue quickly, right? So our average sales price, we don't sell socks for sale, we like to say socks, I don't know why. So we sell, we sell expensive goods, both on the jewelry end and the watches end, so that revenue actually does go up fairly quickly. As far as out there buying, it's a constant thing. Everybody in my company buys. Uh, a lot of companies out there, they rely on a buyer and then salesperson model, right? Where the two are completely separately. I, from day one, have taught my salespeople and my sales department to do both because I felt like for somebody that's out there selling and if at the same token they're buying, they will know the market much, much, much better. Guys like Adrian, guys like Anna, and a few other guys and girls that are here that are in selling, they know the market sometimes even better than me. So by that actually allows me to exponentially be out there buying. Obviously, we also have some specialties within. For example, anything Rolex, I'm gonna go out to Adrian. Some stuff that's a little bit older, I go out to my sales manager, Anna, because she's been around for 15 years selling that, originally probably selling those watches, so she knows the market value and certain things. So, you know, everybody has their niches. I tend to be well-rounded in everything, but when it comes to brand new hot stuff, I'll go out to Adrian because the market changes daily, sometimes even hourly. So he's on top of that game. So he knows that, look, today the Hulk is trading for $16,000, tomorrow is trading for $17,000 because some of the stuff is going up hourly. Same with Hot Royal Oaks and things of that nature because, again, I don't sell these on a daily basis. I don't interact as much when it comes to sale because I run the company, right? I have a lot of responsibilities. I do get on the phone with clients from time to time. My cell phone still rings and, and I still love talking to my clients. I still love selling. Who doesn't love selling, right? But overall, it's diversifying what you're doing within the business, the type of business models, which is wholesale and retail for us. And now there's a new business model that we came out with completely separately, and that's selling of uh, cheaper price goods. I don't want to call them lower end goods, things like fashion watches and fashion jewelry, as well as accessories, lower price point stuff. It's more reliant on bigger platforms such as Amazon, Overstock, among Tmall, among any other thing. This is a bit of a different business model. And uh, again, the goods themselves. Having jewelry in stock where you can buy a ring for $50 or a necklace for half a million dollars and everything in between helps as well, helps attract a bigger crowd. Same goes with watches, I just, as I just mentioned. But you're right, there's only so much in one's day. And one of the biggest fights I personally have had with myself, and, uh, and that is to try to manage your time where uh, I can work 24 seven. I can come in here at six o'clock in the morning and I can leave at 12 o'clock at night and I will have something to do. There's always something to do, especially in your own business, right? You never really stop working. My phone rings after hours all the time. So one of the hardest things I've always had to do is to learn how to manage my time because when you're single, you have a lot more time. When you get married, you have less time. When you start having children, and now three children, that requires a lot more time, and family is important. Family is number one. So now juggling your business and juggling your family at the same time, obviously, where family being most important. So that's probably the hardest thing to do. Uh, we're going to try to scale to 200 million or 300 million. Absolutely, that is the goal. But now I'm not the only one responsible for that. It's not all on my back. Now I have a team of people that work for me, and we're going to do it collectively, and we're going to do it in the way where it's not going to require me to stay in the office till 12 o'clock at night and where I can go home and spend ample enough time with my family while the business is growing. Now it's about coming up with new concepts, having my team help me execute them all, put it in place and sort of let it run on its own. You know, proof of concept onto different business model within the business. So I hope this sheds a little bit of light into your question, guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it here. I'm gonna thank you guys for tuning in once again. Remember, I need more questions from you. These shows are only possible if you guys email me those questions to romansharp at luxurybazaar.com. We've also been getting steady submissions for real watches, real people, real stories. Those emails goes to ian at luxurybazaar.com. Send them in as well. If you guys want to send me in video questions and you want to be featured on my channel, by all means, I'll be happy to play a video of your question as well, but do send them in. If I don't get your questions, there is no Q&A Tuesday. So thank you guys once again. And uh, remember, like, share, subscribe. I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Thank you.